a pleasure for me to introduce Mariano. Uh, Mariano moved to Seattle uh, earlier this year and to join the Allen Institute for Brain Science, where he is an assistant investigator. Uh, so Mariano's research focuses on applying statistical and machine learning methods uh, to decipher how networks of genes and molecules within cells interact to uh, give uh, rise to the cellular diversity observed in the brain. He was a research scientist at the Center for Computational Biology at the Simons Foundation and at the Broad Institute. Uh, and he also collaborated uh, with uh, Mike Jordan's group at UC Berkeley uh, and did some work on uh, Bayesian nonparametric methods for super resolution imaging, which is uh, kind of the connection that I have with him or, or kind of the work that I'm more familiar with. Um, and he got his PhD in neuroscience at Columbia University uh, before that. So um, welcome, Mariano, and uh, really glad to have you around. Thanks, Abel, uh, and uh, welcome everyone that is uh, here. So I'm going to begin this talk by telling you, if let me see, a little bit about uh, my research as Abel was describing it. Uh, and you know my research interest. I'm a, an applied statistician or computational biologist, uh, and I care about building a, a statistical models to extract scientific and meaningful information from scientific data using you know this uh, high dimensional data using high performance algorithms. And because I uh, I care about scientific data, I, I I all my algorithms are rooted in this idea of you know uh, how do we analyze this or extract information from the, from this uh, from scientific information. And in particular, uh, I'm a, a kind of a neuroscientist or you know a computational neuroscientist. That uh, the question that I really care is about how do we know or how do we uh, understand. How do single embryonic progenitor cells give rise to the enormous diversity that we observe in the brain? So all the algorithms that I built care about trying to prove different aspects of this process. And I will argue that there has never been a better time to do this type of research, combining algorithms with uh, neuroscience, because now we have a, a wide range of uh, multimodal data that profile individual cells and look at the morphology, the connectivity, or the physiology of each of these individual cells. During this talk, and here in this slide, I'm showing you a kind of an example of this. I'm going to talk about cortical interneurons. These are the local neurons within the cerebral cortex. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the development of these neurons. Cortical interneurons, just to begin the talk and, and frame it, the, the main question, the, the main neuroscientific question. Cortical interneurons originate from a region deep in the brain called the medial ganglionic eminence. And if you look at this region, you can identify progenitor cells and also already committed or already differentiated neurons, all right? So the cortical interneurons and the progenitors that give rise to them. If we take all the cells within this region, and we perform single cell RNA-seq, or we profile the transcriptome of these cells, what we can recapitulate is the development of these cells. So on the right, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I think you cannot. Uh, on the right, what I'm showing you is that each point on that diagram is a cell. It's the low dimensional representation of the transcriptome of those cells, all right? And you can see that we can arrange the cells into a one-dimensional trajectory. So if we follow this trajectory, we go from the progenitors to the already differentiated neurons. Now I'm going to zoom in into the neurons. And if when we look at the neurons, we can see that these neurons can become one out of three lineages. One in particular is the cortical interneurons that we care about, all right? So the question I'm going to try to answer during this entire talk is the following. Is there any indication at the progenitors, the cells that give rise to the neurons, is there any indication of the commitment of the progenitors to any of these three lineages that I just show you? And when we look at the transcriptional landscape of or at single cell RNA-seq information, we fail to identify any evidence of commitment within the mitotic, within the progenitor. 
So when, when I start all of this work, and the, the main focus of this talk is what, what other cellular modality can we look at trying to answer this question of sulfate commitment? And in particular, we are going to focus on the chromatin landscape. I will explain to you in the next slides what chromatin means, but chromatin is a cellular feature that is associated with a cell type commitment. So kind of the agenda for this talk will be the following. I'm going to start giving you a gentle introduction into chromatin and the analysis of chromatin information. I'm going to describe state space models that I created to analyze chromatin information. Then I'm going to use these algorithms in particular to analyze cortical interneurons. And then I'm going to extend these algorithms to uh, multimodal deep generative models to try to bridge transcriptional information and chromatin information at the single cell level. All right, I'm going to start with the introduction of chromatin. And I want you to think uh, uh, in a cell as a, a information processing machinery in which DNA encodes, or, or it's the tape that has all the information about the, that directs the cellular machine, machinery to generate different uh, cell type specific gene expression program. So the cell has to look at the tape or at DNA and express genes in different type of cell. But here, the information processing machinery is subject to some constraints. So the DNA, all of this tape, has to be packed and compactified within the cell, so within a tiny space, all right? But at the same time, as I'm telling you, the DNA has to be uh, relaxed or accessible to the cellular machinery to direct gene expression profile. So as I have been describing, there is a tension between compactification and you know, relaxation of DNA. So that's why chromatin or DNA, no? chromatin is the shape of DNA, can be found in two, one out of two different states. Chromatin can be relaxed or open, or chromatin can be quite compactified or in a closed state. If it's relaxed, it will be accessible for the cellular machinery. All right. How do we measure chromatin? So in recent years, uh, people have developed uh, genomic assays to profile the state of chromatin. And these assays are in particular, one of the most successful is called ATAXIC. And it measure uh, the accessibility, the, the state of chromatin by uh, introducing some enzymes that leave behind if the chromatin is accessible, reads. All right, what do I mean with this? So if we look at the genome of, for example, immune cells in which we have profiled uh, ataxic information, what we can see is that uh, what I'm showing you on the bottom of this screen is that at certain locations in the genome, you can see that there are many reads highlighted by these you know, accumulations, these peaks, and other regions where you have almost no reads, right? So what it means is that for regions in which chromatin has been accessible, you have many reads and you would like to identify these regions like uh, that I'm highlighting in red. And for regions in which it's kind of the background noise, you would like to identify it as inaccessible or closed chromatin. So when you are thinking about the analysis of chromatin, the very first challenge that you need to solve is to identify where are the red regions that I'm highlighting here, where is chromatin accessible from the inaccessible regions. Because compared to RNA, in which in RNA, you know where the genes are located throughout the genomes. In chromatin, you do not know a priori what are the accessible regions. So what I'm going to tell you next are uh, uh, an algorithm called Chroma that solves this very first challenge of identifying accessible versus inaccessible chromatin. And this is joint work with Rich Bono and Anders uh, Rasmussen at uh, the Simons Foundation. So, I'm going to model uh, the, the genome with a set of states. So I, for example, here, uh, each of the variables S1 represent a latent state that is associated with the chromatin state, all right? And for each of the, uh, of the basis of the genome, I have associated to it certain number of reads to each of the bases. And I'm going to model a transition between two states. Chromatin can be in an accessible or a close or an accessible or open state. And I'm going to transition between these two states. 
So for everyone, you know, like the, the connoisseurs or every statistician, once that I start talking about the set of states and a transition between them, the very first thing that, that come to mind is the hidden Markov model in which given the current state, I'm going to transition into the next state with the transition matrix. If I follow, you know, a hidden Markov model, the length of each of the states, it follows a geometric distribution. But when we start looking at this problem, we believe that, you know, a geometric distribution that doesn't represent the true biology, a biologically plausible assumption for the length of each of these individual states. So we decided to introduce into the model a, a more you know, biologically plausible uh, assumption. And we resorted to hidden semi-Markov model and in which we are, every time we transition to the next state, we are going to sample from a distribution and know how many bases are, will I remain in the next state, all right? So for example, I'm in closed chromatin and now I, I know that I'm going to transition into a next state. If I'm going to transition into open chromatin, I will sample from, in this case, a negative binomial distribution. And this will tell me how many bases I will remain in the next state. In this case, we choose a negative binomial distribution because you know, it represents what we know a priori from the biology. There are no closed or open regions that have one or two base pairs. And there are no open or closed regions that have you know, like the entire chromosome as accessible. Also, because the negative binomial distribution has some mathematical uh, tricks that we can apply, which uh, a negative binomial distribution can be represented as a sum of geometric distribution. So this allows us to uh, create a transition matrix that for each of the negatively distributed state, we can build kind of a, a transition matrix that accounts for many of these uh, geometric distribution, kind of for each macro state, will have certain microstates that all together encompass this type of distribution. All right, so, so far I have told you, you know, how to represent the latent state of the model, which is the, these transitions, which uh, links each of the, you know, the latent states. To fully specify the model, what I have to tell you is that how do we generate it, uh, observations given the latent state? And in particular, given the, the sparsity in the data, we choose to use like a geometric distribution. So with the transition between states and the way I generate the data, I have fully described the generative model of my, of, of, uh, of my uh, probabilistic model. Now, what I have to tell you is that how do we perform posterior estimates of the parameters of this model? Uh, in particular, so we use, uh, but uh, Bayesian inference, so we set you know certain priors on the distribution of the parameter, and we create we we seek to create posterior estimates of the latent state of each of the uh, of the states of chromatin across the genome, and we know that computing the posterior distribution of the parameters is uh, intractable, and infer inference is the key problem that we need to solve, and to to solve this issue, the, this problem, we resorted to approximated Bayesian inference method, in particular variational inference, in which we propose a variational distribution that seeks to approximate the true posterior by minimizing the KL divergence. But remember, so we have to infer the chromatin state at each base in the genome. So we have billions of parameters to infer. So even resorting to posterior uh, variational inference method is not enough to create all of these uh, estimates in minutes, no? Uh, so we had to actually to engineer a little bit the solution and resort to uh, certain heuristics to be able to create batches of data. And then on top of that, we use a, a form of variational inference that is not the more common stochastic one, but it's a, a memoized a flavor of variational inference in which for each of the batches, you can create a sufficient statistics to update our parameters. So, and then you are going to remember the sufficient statistics of each of the batches. So you are updating, so for example, you touch a batch, you update the parameters and remember the sufficient statistics. The next batch that you touch, you are going to create posterior, uh, sufficient statistics of this batch, but update the parameters using the sufficient statistics that you have already seen. 
once that we built, you know, uh, our, so far what I have told you is, is that I built algorithms and then the inferential method to estimate the parameter. Next, what I'm showing you now is that uh, there are many, or, or there are different algorithms that try to achieve the same as, as we do, no? to estimate the state of chromatin at each base in the genome. So we compare these methods that we term chroma against uh, the more commonly used algorithms in the field. And what we, we were able to see is that we are able to recover against ground truth information uh, more than 40% more accessible regions, uh, in particular focusing in a competing approach that, uh, that is widely used in the field, that is MAX2, that hasn't been as particularly tailored to attack seek information. And also what we have shown is that if we reduce the signal to noise of, uh, of the data set, we are able to retain hand sensitivity even up to 500 cells or to a really low signal to noise. What I'm going to tell you next is one extension of our methods that I really like. And it's the idea that how do we deal with information when we have many different replicates? And in this case, what we are going to do is like, we're going to estimate the state of chromatin for each individual replicate. And we are going to have a consensus representation that harness a statistical power from each of the individual replicates. And we are going to, create a set of states for each replicate and also a set of states for at each individual base along the genome and a set of states for the consensus representation. And we are going to link the consensus to each individual replicate by enlarging the transition probability of each state. And basically the intuition behind that is that if I'm in a state and I'm going to transition into the next state at a, at a base pair, I'm going to look at the state of the consensus. And I'm going to be more likely to transition, for example, in open state, if the consensus representation is in an open state. And this is not also you know, cool to harness a statistical power from different replicates, but also if we have different data sets of, or different cellular populations, we can kind of uh, use all of this information through this algorithm and identify what is common or what is the common chromatin landscape across all of this cellular population, which uh, naturally, as you will see, uh, lends me to the next part of the talk in, in which we are trying to use uh, all of this uh, information or, or this algorithm to study cortical interneurons. And this is a joint work uh, in which we apply all of these algorithms to study cortical, the development of cortical interneurons, a uh, joint work with Gore Fischel and Kate Alloway from Harvard, HMS, and the Broad Institute. So again, we're going to use these algorithms to understand chromatin, the chromatin landscape in cortical interneurons during the development of these cells. And as I told you before, cortical interneurons develop from a region deep in the brain called the medial ganglionic eminence. And what it's highlighting here in the slide, E13, E14, means the time point at which cortical interneurons arise. And in particular in this work, we profile many different time points, but I'm going to focus in, during this talk just on the early development of the neurons. And what I'm going to do is, again, trying to compare or trying to see if Chromatin helps me identify early indications of cell identity or cell specification or, uh, better than RNA. And how do these two features compare to each other? What I told you at the beginning of this talk is that uh, if we isolate the cells in the MG, the, the region where cortical interneurons originate, uh, what we can see is that there are two types of cells, the progenitors, and they already committed neurons. And if we build a low dimensional representations of these cells using transcriptional information, what we can see again here with a different data set is that they follow a one dimensional trajectory uh, highlighting on the bottom left, in which each dot is a cell. And this one dimensional trajectory recapitulates the development of the cells. How do we know this? 
because if we look at the gene expression, and this is the new panel that has appeared, we can associate early in the trajectory uh, genes that are uh, highlighting, for example, the progenitor state, and, low, and later in the trajectory, genes that are expressed in already committed neurons. So basically, I'm traversing this one-dimensional trajectory of the cells. And what I'm showing you here is how do the gene expression is represented along this trajectory, OK? So now, I would like to do the same for chromatin. But as we are seeing here, we have two populations, uh, progenitors and neurons. So we can use chroma, actually, to be able to infer a common chromatin landscape for uh, progenitors and already committed neurons, all right? And then create a low dimensional representation based just on the chromatin or the ataxic information. So this is what I'm showing you in the new panel in which it says ataxic, in which each dot is a cell. And again, we can arrange the cells into a one dimensional trajectory that starts with progenitor cells and ends with already post mitotic neurons. And if we traverse this one dimensional trajectory, and what I'm showing you here is the panel on the right, and we look at the chromatin accessibility or the state of chromatin and certain genomic locations that are associated with the genes that I showed you before, what we can see is kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence in which genes that were early expressed at the progenitor state, we find the nearby chromatin accessible at the same time points. And genes that were expressed in the, at the neurons or, or later on in this one-dimensional trajectory, the chromatin is accessible later on. Um, and again, if we look at uh, just at the neurons, as I, show you, as I told you at the beginning of the talk, and we can see that these neurons can be associated with one out of three lineages. And once that we, if we take again each of the neurons at the, uh, using the chromatin landscape, what we can see is that, again, we can find this, recapitulate the same three trajectories. However, what we failed to identify here was any indication of cell type commitment early on using the chromatin landscape. So all of these uh, representations that I'm showing you here are single cell representations using single cell RNA-seq or single cell ataxic chromatin or transcriptional information. And again, this, uh, all of this analysis has been done, you know, making correspondence between the two data types. But uh, when I was uh, doing this type of analysis, what, uh, what it was clear to me was that the next level of algorithms, what they need to do is to be able to harness both data types and create a common representation of the cellular state using all the multimodal information that is present in the cell. So this you know, naturally lends to the, uh, actually the last part of, of my talk in which I use uh, multimodal deep generative models to actually being able to create low dimensional representations of the cells, integrating protein, transcriptomic or chromatin information. And uh, this is joint work with uh, a grad student in, at UC Berkeley, Tal Ashwa, and Nira and Mike Jordan at UC Berkeley. So I kind of believe that you know, there, there is a, a great opportunity here to use, for example, all of this single cell information from individual modalities to identify a latent cellular state that uh, can be linked to different cellular types, as I'm showing you in, in the middle of the slide, through probabilistic models that will account for different technical factors or different nuances in the data that you know, we would like unwanted dimensions of variation that we would like to remove. So what I'm going to show you next is you know, efforts towards this direction in which we created an algorithm called MultiBI that uh, integrates protein expression, transcriptomic information, and chromatin accessibility to create a common representation of cellular identity. 
and will allow us to do hypothesis testing for each of the individual modalities. So I'm going to begin by describing how did we build this type of model. And we have in the lab, uh, uh, near Yosef, uh, in his lab, and together with Mike, have already been working on this problem, trying to describe the information present in each individual modalities, for example, chromatin accessibility or transcriptional information. Uh, and as I showed you before, chromatin information can be found in one out of two states, open or closed chromatin. So if we look at each uh, of the cells, what we can describe the state of chromatin at each you know, chromatin region and each one of these regions that we identify as either accessible or inaccessible, we can describe it using a Bernoulli distribution, like I'm showing you in the chromatin accessibility model. If we are going to in turn describe the gene expression profile, we know that for each of the cells, what we count is the num number of molecules, RNA molecules, that have been expressed in each of the cells. So we can describe this number of molecules using a negative binomial distribution, all right? And all of the states of these cells will be described, or the state of it, each of the cells will be described with a, a, a multivariate normal distribution in which if I want to describe the, uh, the generative model of, of, of the generative model of, of this type of algorithm, I will sample the state of each of the cells. And given the state of the cells, I will reconstruct the observations through a nonlinear representation that describes the mean accessibility or the mean expression of each of the genes. And our models actually account for different particularities of the, you know, the, the, the collection or the experimental procedures in which we uh, account for the number of times or the library size, the number of times that each of the cells have been sampled. Uh, or, and we also account for a feature specific gene expression or chromatin accessibility, uh, feature specific parameters. So again, if I want to describe the generative model, I will sample from the latent state of each of the cells and given each of these states of, for each of the cells, I will describe how the observations are generated through this uh, generative model. Again, to perform parameter inference in this setting, given the data, we are going to resort to Bayesian inference. And we are going to resort to posterior estimates of the, uh, the latent states, for example, the latent states in this case, the latent states of the cells. Uh, we are going to use uh, variational approximations again, but now I want to describe certain particularities of our model. We decided to choose a, a quite particular variational approximation that actually builds two individual or, or one individual uh, latent space for each modality that we are profiled. For example, I'm highlighting with the square with the red square here that for, if we measure, for example, ATAC-seq and RNA-seq, we are going to build a low dimensional representation for chromatin and for RNA information. And then for cells in which we measure both modalities, we are going to compute an average representation, an average latent space. And we are also going to introduce a penalty that tries to bring both representations together. We are doing this, uh, this construction of this variational approximation because if we have cells in which we just measure one individual modality, we can just take the, uh, the variational posterior and the generative model of that modality and account for uh, all that is necessary to represent that cell. But so this model allows us to represent single measurements, single modality measurement, are, are measurements in which we measure both modalities. But to bring, actually, this is a, a caveat, to bring both representation or the multimodal representation together, we need cells in which we measure all the modalities at, uh, at the same time. And the idea is that uh, these latent representations that, that we build will uh, reveal aspects of, for example, cell identity and we remove any unwanted dimension of variation. And looking at the low dimensional representation, we can stratify cells given cell types or populations 
And uh, given this low dimensional representation, we can accelerate, for example, the annotations of the cells and visualize it in a way that it's biologically meaningful. And when we compute posterior estimates of the gene expression for each of the cells, we're able to draw better estimates of differential accessibility and dependencies between the multimodal uh, experiment. And I'm going to substantiate all of, actually all of these claims by uh, looking at some results. Uh, and these results actually cope with uh, the following uh, aspects. So we are going to show, I'm going to show you a couple of results in which we take certain data sets, in this case, PBMC cells, one type of uh, cells in the immune system, in which we profile transcriptional and chromatin information in each of the cells. So for these cells, I will call these cells, in which we have both information per cells. This is what I'm describing in the, in the image as per cell. And then I'm going to separate these cells artificially and pair them into cells in which we only have RNA-seq or cells in which we only have ataxic. And for these cells, Actually, so I have the ground truth information about uh, the identity of the cells. So I can create these low dimensional representations and then assess where are the representation of the cells for the modality, the individual modalities, All right? So I can take one individual cells in which I have just uh, RNA information or I just have chromatin information, but I know this information comes from the cell, same cell and I can look at the latent space and see where these half cells uh, are located in the latent space. And then I can compute a distance, actually, okay. I can compute the distance between the latent, uh, the latent uh, representations of these cells. And I'm going to do that in a particular way. I'm going to start with the data set that it's fully pair. So all of the cells are, we have information from both modalities. And then I'm going to start uh, unpairing the, uh, the cells until I reach, for example, 99.9% .9 of the cells being unpaired. And I'm going to start seeing how this, uh, this, the, the distance between these cells degrades or how, you know, how the alignment between the two individual modalities degrades. And what we can see in the bottom right of the slide is that uh, we are able to associate you know, uh, the half cells quite well throughout a wide range of unpaired levels. And what I'm showing you here on the right, on, on the top representation is actually a data set in which we have, if, if I'm not incorrect, like 50% of the cells per and 50% of the cells unpair. all right? And uh, what this is showing us is that even up to uh, actually from the bottom, bottom right uh, panel, even up to having 90% of the cells unpaired, if we just have 10% of them being paired, we are able to bring the two modalities together and, bring, uh, and build a low dimensional representation that accounts or reflect each of the modalities. Right, so if I look at the point in the low dimensional representation, I can reconstruct all the multimodal, uh, multimodal information, in this case, chromatin and RNA. And this idea of you know, both modalities, I'm going to substantiate it even more now with the next slide, because what I'm, the computational experiment that we did was the following. We are going to take the PBMC cells again. And again, we have both for each cell, we have both ataxic and RNA-seq information. But we are going to take an entire population, for example, the B cells, that in the, in the low dimensional representation on the right is highlighting with the circle in red. And for those cells, I'm going to remove all the ataxic information, all right? So I'm going to now try to create posterior estimates of ataxic or chromatin information just based on the measurements of the transcriptional or the single cell RNA-seq information present in the cells. And if it's true that this you know, low dimensional representation cap capture both aspects 
of chromatin and transcription, we should be able to create posterior estimates that are robust uh, or that are accurate. All right, so basically this, now create posterior estimates of accessibility given gene, exp gene expression or transcriptional information. So this is what we did actually. And what I'm showing you here on the right is the, the probability of accessibility given the uh, chromatin information. So all, all of these are posterior estimates given the ground truth data that we know, but we have removed from the, uh, from the model. Uh, and what we can see is that we are quite accurate representing you know, uh, this posterior accessibility given the, uh, the, uh, the, true, uh, the ground truth data that, that we observe. And what I'm showing you on the bottom right, these two panels that I'm not sure if they look uh, with high definition is the following experiment. We can take these B cells in which we have removed all ataxic information and trying to predict what chromatin regions are differential accessible. And we can try to predict it when in models that have been trained uh, with all the information, uh, models in which the, for B cells, we have chromatin and ataxic. And in the model that I just described in which the ataxic information has been removed from the model. So for the, the later model, we are creating posterior estimates of a differential accessibility. So we, are, so we are computing this differential accessibility, hiding or not the uh, chromatin information. And what we are seeing is that there is a high correlation between our posterior estimates and the true differential accessibility of the, uh, of the regions, of the chromatin regions in for B cells against all of the rest of the cells. And there is a high level of overlap uh, around the significant peaks that are differential accessible between both of the cells. Uh, okay. And I'm actually, I think that we are at uh, 4.15 around. Uh, I'm wrapping up the talk by uh, kind of reiterating uh, what I have shown you, uh, a set of algorithms that, you know, start describing the chromatin landscape and uh, at the aggregated population, looking at aggregated group of cells, and then uh, look using single cell information, we are able to uh, create uh, algorithms that look at create low dimensional representations of not only trans chromatin information, but also transcriptional. And how do we make them, both of them come together? Uh, and along the way, I have shown you a little bit about uh, you know, uh, interneuron uh, development and how do we identify early indications of sulfate commit. Uh, so, Abel, yes. Gee. I don't know if there have been questions along the way or I well, was. I, think I haven't seen your questions so far. But actually, personally, I, I myself have some a, a quick questions. So it might be kind, kind of. Uh, so but I saw you have all this beautiful visualization, like when you show this component one, component two, and then we can see this beautiful trajectory. So I'm wondering, like, how do you do this visual? Because I think the original data is high dimensional. I guess you put, are you using the TISNI or the UMAP method to do these visualizations? Yes. So we typically build low dimensional representations now that typically it is in 10, 20 dimensions. And then we use TSNE or UMAP. So for example, for our, if I go back, like any of the, you know, this is actual data. So for this one, you know, the latent representation of the cells is 10 dimensions. And then we use TSNE or UMAPs, actually UMAPs in this case, to, you know, collapse the information to two dimensions. Yeah. Great, great. Oh, so I see a question in the Q&A. So the question is that, how much does the hidden semi-Markov model of Chrome, Chrome A improve on a Verlina hidden Markov model with the forward backward algorithm? Yes, so I haven't shown you, but there was a competing approach that also at the time were thinking, were thinking along the same lines and uh, and it improves around 20% uh, of uh, like accuracy to recover, you know, accessible regions uh, against 
there is you know some something to explain that how do we build for example the ground truth information so we annotate a data set using many different data sets like that measure different uh, different aspects of uh, the binding or the accessible chromatin and we use these to uh, you know assess the accuracy of our method and then we compare against max2 or this hmm model and our hidden semi markov model and what we can see is that as we better model more and more aspects of the biology, we recover in more and more, you know, accurate uh, accessible regions. So uh, like in summary, we are able to perform actually around 20, 15% uh, better than a, a, a vanilla HMM, paying some costs for, you know, the uh, inferential, uh, you know, complexity of the model now because each macro state, each negative binomial state will now have a set of micro states, you know, to represent uh, the, the macro state. Thanks. And I think Abel, you also have a question. So I would just let Abel ask. Thanks. I think Seth was actually in front of me. Uh, there was a question in the chat. So why don't you go ahead with that and then I'll ask. So you mean the question in the chat, but somehow I actually, I didn't see the question in the In the Q&A. Oh yeah, I, I already, I already, uh, it. Yeah. yeah, that was it. Okay, so I guess I do have a couple of questions, Mariano. So uh, the first one is going back to kind of Genchi's comment is, so how did you choose the dimensionality in the first place? So you talked about, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 dimensions and then doing some kind of further collapsing of that. How did you pick 10 or 20 in the first place? Uh, yes, so basically we, it's kind of an empirical approach in which we uh, are able, for example, so we train our models also using cross-validation. So we choose the latent representation to account, you know, for posterior inference, uh, accurate posterior estimates. So it's, uh, we could call it, it's a little bit doing empirical base in certain sense, because we do touch the data, but at the end, what we do is we extrapolate from different data sets. Now, once that we are developing this algorithm, we test it in different data sets. And we know that, for example, for a certain, you know, for, for this type of data with 10 or 20 dimensions, we are able to accurate reconstruct, you know, uh, posterior estimates of the data. So, okay. And, and so let me ask you a follow up to that. Uh, that is, so, so the challenge, particularly in the in the last project where you are kind of doing uh, some non-linear mapping to the latent space, is ensuring identifiability of the of the latent space. So, in the linear case, it's easy because you basically just need to control for uh, essentially rotations, shifts, and 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 mirroring. But once you go non-linear, then uh, essentially you have to control for an infinite number of things. So, so when trying to do the kind of matching that you guys did uh, more or less empirically, trying to match these two uh, latent spaces constructed from the two modalities, I mean, I understand the kind of the empirical or, or you know, the, the, the ad hoc approach that you guys are using, but there is really no guarantee that you are really matching things that are actually comparable to each other. We do have constraints. So okay, do so could you elaborate a little bit on those? Yeah, that yes. would be interesting. So now I cannot switch, but uh, so for example, all the library or, or I, sadly I cannot point, but for example, if you look at the Bernoulli model, L sub C and R J uh, are constrained to sum to one and also P sub C J. So, uh, and so for example, if we look at the negative binomial model, L sub C is also constrained to sum to one. So in that sense, there is where you break the degeneracy. So if you look at the negative binomial model, S sub C is constrained to sum to one, for example. Uh, and that actually helps resolve some of the, uh, of the degeneracy. To tell you the truth, you know, we have explored these models up and down and some iterations of, of the models, for example, use the empirical estimators of L sub C, which is related to the number of reads that the cell have, because this L sub C tries to account for the, you know, the library size, which is, you know, the number of times that the cell has been sampled. So uh, we use something that is yeah, normalized to one, but related to the, the number of counts in the cell. 
And we don't estimate in that case L sub C, and we actually uh, are able to create good you know, representations of, of, of the cell. Great, thank you. Other questions from the audience? Personally, I have actually another question, but so just, just out of curious, I know that a lot of the time, like when people are dealing with problems like this, people prefer to use a Bayesian approach. So why not you? So I can see the well. It seems that even if you don't use the Bayesian approach, you could still think about using the maximum likelihood to estimate to estimate all the parameter. But I guess the problem of that is first, the MLE is probably that will be multimodal. So finding the MLE, even if you know, it's going to be difficult because if you're multimodal, it's non-convex problem. So yeah, it's even if you do gradient ascent, descent, or EML grant, you could still suffer from that. So I think Bayesian approach might might seem to be a better way, especially you can easily get a you, you know using a posterior distribution to construct a like an uncertainty estimate. But if you do the traditional way, MLE, it might be quite difficult to really compute the answer, even if you suppose you can compute the MLE, but you, you, it's not so easy to, to compute, I think, the, the uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean what you could ask actually if you want to be more you know, I I don't know the word, but if you want to, you know, put the yeah, yeah to, to be the third reviewer is that are our models truly calibrated? And I can only tell you that we know they are empirically. So, you know, we do a lot of uh, empirical validation against, for example, aggregates. Like you can take, for example, the latent space and average the, the cells that are nearby using even different methods. No, so we want to, you know, just not to, you know, if we use the aggregates that are the latent spaces that are computed with our method. And we look at the, you know, aggregated accessibility, well, probably, you know, it's related to our posterior estimate. But, uh, but again, so if using different methods, we look at the uncertainty, for example, of the posterior accessibility of, you know, one region in one cell against the local aggregate. And what we can see is that, uh, you know, there is quite a, a high correlation between these two values. And what is really cool, this is a nuances of, you know, of the model that once after you, you have looked at the model so much, you know, like that uh, there are certain cells in, that I'm highlighting there, for example, on the top right, for example, graph mm -hmm. in which we are really, so if you see the uncertainty, it goes like back to zero. So we are really confident but uh, the error is high, which means that you know the observed accessibility was zero, but we are predicting one. And what is going on is that the data is so sparse that uh, our models are looking at the nearby cells and are accurately predicting that the accessibility is accessible, but it's so sparse that you you are collecting data from a few cells. So uh, you know, like. Uh, you know, all of these kind of uh, highlight that you know, our models have biological relevance, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. So any other questions for Mariano? Well, let me ask one last question uh, quickly. Um, so one of the challenges with variational methods, Mariano, as you know, is that uncertainty is usually underestimated for, for the parameters. That's just by definition, there is nothing that you can really do about it. Um, so uh, it looks like you are really mostly interested in either prediction. And, and when I talk prediction, I mean point prediction or, or point estimation. Uh, so maybe that's why you don't care too much about that fact. Or, or if not, then you know how do you deal with the fact that you, you are underestimating the, the variability? So, you know, yes. Variational inference is well known that underestimates, you know, uh, posterior uncertainty. But I will argue that you know, variational inference have first, you know, has moved way, you know, forward compared to our original estimates. And now we, you know, we propose variational distribution that are a structure, and we can account sometimes better, you know, for the uh, posterior estimate. Again, we are underestimating, we, we don't represent, you know, sampling method. For the first model, it's true that I'm 
fully computing you know, point estimates, and I'm actually thresholding the state of chromatin. So as long as, you know, in that case, I actually don't care about uncertainty. I just care, you know, about prediction and then, you know, uh, so about, you know, good predictions and, and it's almost a classifier. In this case, uh, it could be true, you know, there are different gaps that you can find, you know, how, how, how representative is your variational proposal? Uh, how far away is the elbow from the actual you know, uh, value? And yes, uh, it's kind of resorting to the, the previous point that I was mentioning. Now, how, how do we know that our methods are truly calibrated? And, you know, I don't have an answer for that, except that, yes, we are probably underestimate our you know, uncertainty. Thank you, Mariano. Okay. Oh, finally, I saw another question in the Q&A. Yeah, so the very, for the variational inference, do you have, did you have to consider new variational approximation for the biology problem akin to how, how the uh, MB works better for chromatin, or is it just a standard mean field representation? Uh, so I guess he's referring to the first problem, you know, the, the hidden semi-markup model. And in that case, uh, what we assumed was a, a structure variation approximation. So a, a fully mean field representation will be each of the state of the cells will be, yet yeah, the latent representation of the cell will be fully factorized. However, if you look at the representation of the variational proposal, uh, yeah, it's not a fully factorized, it's an structural variational representation. So, uh, you know, it's the next level of, of complexity that you can do uh, and still create, for example, in this case, uh, so in the second case, you could clearly see it's, uh, it's similar to a variation out encoder and we use the reparameterization tricks and stochastic gradients to create posterior estimates. In this case, we are using a structure variational approximations, but uh, we are using um, natural gradients or, uh, wow, I don't know why the, the word is escaping me, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually natural gradients, uh, but uh, it's not a fully factorized uh, variational inference, but we can write closed form uh, updates for the uh, parameters. Okay, great. Any, quest any questions? Okay, so, and... So if there's no other question, let's thank Mariano again for this really great talk, very inspiring talk. And thanks everybody for participating and happy holidays and happy new years. <laughs> thank you. Happy holidays thank and you. to all the students, good luck in their exams. <laughs> <laughs> and good luck on the exams. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.